It's the Locked On Flyers podcast for Wednesday, September 20th, your daily dose of Flyers news, analysis, and high quality content that is excited for main training camp to get going. Yeah, let's go. We're going to get into expectations for all the vets returning all on today's show. Your Locked On Flyers, your daily podcast on the Philadelphia Flyers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hey there, and thanks for making Lockdown Flyers your first listen every day. I am Rachel Donner. You can find me on the app formerly known as Twitter at rmiriam. I'm here as always with Russ Cohen, who's on all your favorite social media apps at Sportsology. And we as a show are on Twitter, Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky, all at Lockdown flyers you can subscribe or follow us for free over on youtube or on the sirius xm app anywhere you listen to podcasts you'll get our latest episode as soon as it's available here on the locked on podcast network your team every day uh, before we dig into expectations for the guys we did hear from danny briere to kick off uh, main training camp and i think yeah he was very upbeat in what he was talking about. I think, you know, one of the main things he felt good about was that people are healthy. I mean, except for J.R. Avon and Mann, who got hurt in uh, rookie camp, everybody else is healthy. Coots and Atkinson are skating. And um, for those two in particular, he was excited to have them back, especially on special teams and, and Coots for face-offs, Cam on the power play for shooting. So I think like he wanted to sort of emphasize that those guys were back. I mean, I'm not dreaming about that yet because last year we would have said that about Atkinson. And then after the first preseason game, it was like, what happened to Cam Atkinson? So like, it's the same path. I can't go down the same path until I actually see him and I see him yeah. play three, three or four games. And I see him taking the, you know, the, the, the trips, whether it's bus or whatever, then, you know, I could start to see what Cam Atkinson is. It, to me, it's like, okay. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think, you know, we can see them skating in practice all we want, but I, I really want to see those guys in game situations for a few games just to see how they look and, you know, what the wear and tear is like and what their endurance Getting hit. is like. Yeah, all of that stuff. Uh, but uh, Briere seems to be pretty positive about it. And I think one of the things he mentioned that would be a good side effect of it is that unlike last season, guys like Noah Cates and Morgan Frost won't have as much pressure on them in terms of the top line competition, um, face offs in those ways, because uh, we all know the Flyers struggled, struggled mightily in the face off circle last year. But again, we can't say that yet. Like, that's the whole thing. Like, I wish he would have taken more of a cautiously optimistic thing. It's good to be optimistic, but it should be cautiously optimistic because the minute mm -hmm. one of those things starts to fail, if it does, then it does affect those guys and it is going to affect how they play and what they do. So maybe to start the season, it might not, but we don't know that yet. We're not even through preseason. So that's why I would say cautiously optimistic. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, one of the other things he was asked about a lot and talked about was his confidence in John Tortorella in terms of managing all of that. So managing the prospects coming up and, and their ice time and putting them in a position to succeed, um, you know, had real confidence in, in terms of him managing the younger players as well. Um, and that... He, you know, he, he just really thought this was a good position for this team at this point to be in having torts around. And I think that, you know, there's there's pros and cons. We all know what the pros and, and cons are. And I think that, you know, it's not as rosy as he was painting, but I, I think that he's right to a, a point. Yeah, he's right to a point. It's definitely not as rosy because like Cam York, yes, that was a, su a success when they sent him down and he came back up and it was great. But other players that he sent down, it's not like he stayed in constant contact or wanted to see how they could fit it in the future. No, once they were sent down, he doesn't think about them. He, you know, maybe he sees them once in a blue moon, but he doesn't think about them. He thinks about his current NHL team. We know this. He says it. He'll always say it. And so, yeah, I, I think part of that's true. Yeah. I think, you know, he was asked specifically about what 
success looks like this season. And he emphasized player development and building mm-hmm. the culture and structure. And Torts is a huge part of that. And so I think that it's going to be a, a real interesting you know, inflection point in maybe late November, early December, when we see, okay, what does this team really look like? And is towards following through on all of that? Right. Because I still expect John to try and win. And so like early on, you know, he's going to play Mark Stahl in big spots. He's going to play vets in big spots. And that might hurt some, some younger players uh, early on as far as playing time. And I, fully expect to see that i'm not going to rip him for it but i'm just saying i don't expect him to just say yeah this is a development year don't worry about it we can come in second to last he's not going to say that so that's where there's going to be this struggle there is always going to be this struggle with torts and that yeah and he did mention specifically that he hopes the players use motivation of being predicted to be bottom dwellers in the league in order to put forth more effort in terms of trying to win games or at least battle in games, which I think is fair. I think that is something that occurs in sports. You know, when a team is said to be bad, they use it as motivation. So I think that aspect of it was fine, but um, I do think, you know, you do have to take the rose colored glasses off a little bit in this situation. I mean, you do. I mean, if you look at it from our perspective, even if we believe Couturier and Atkinson could play, I don't know, up to 70% of what they used to be. How much better could we say they that they are in this division? You know what I mean? It's like this division's hard. Yeah. Yeah. They're not better That's- than the Rangers. They're not better than the Devils. They're not better than the car- the Hurricanes. So, like, you know, what are we talking about here? Yeah, I think it's going to be, you know, real interesting when these games actually occur and, yeah. and we have a, a better sense of what the, the competition looks like. Um, I thought there were two other interesting things. Number one, he was asked about the goalie situation, uh, emphasized that Carter Hart is his number one. It's wide open after that. And um, they're still waiting on the Hockey Canada NHL report, just like the rest of us. And when they find out what's going on, they'll deal with it from there. Yeah, see, there's there's one, there's one, two things with that. We don't know Carter Hart's going to start the season. We don't. So... He might be number one all through camp and then something happens and, you know, the the report comes in and all of a sudden he's not there. That could happen. Right. And they know that could happen. So that's that's one thing to say that there's it's wide open after that is really not being totally honest. It's great to say, but John Tortorella thinks Sam Erson's the backup. We know he thinks he's the backup. And so he's the backup. Like nothing is going to change that. It's just a matter of what happens with the number one spot and, you know, will Hart be playing or not? Like, that's really where we're at. We know this. Well, I I do think as far as the backup spot goes, assuming Carter Hart is number one, like Breyer says, is that it's Sam Erson's to lose. Right. Like, that's your starting off point. But but then things could have just said that, like, because that's what we all know. Yeah, I think that he can't say that right now, okay. but, which is fine. But uh, fine. I think that uh, it's just interesting to see what he says versus what we think the reality is. I think the other uh, interesting question that was asked was about the Mike Babcock situation in Columbus and that, um, you know, John Tortorella isn't the same as Babcock. That's for sure. No, nobody different. would ever say that. They're very different guys, but you can lump them together in this old school reputation, right? Yeah. And Breer said, no, no, no. Like, Torts is a very different guy than Mike Babcock, and he cares about his players and wants to get the most out of them. The trust is there. But I, I did think, you know, it was a- an interesting and apt comparison that was that was made. No, that's fine. I mean, it, it is uh, fair to a point, and I think John does care more about the players, but we also see when there's a point where John stops caring, and that's if you can't um, play his system, then he stops caring for you. Uh, I'm sure Kevin Hayes will say that there was a point where John stopped caring for him. You know, yeah. So, I mean, there's a yeah. there's a limit here, and we, we all know that. But the other thing I have to get into is uh, with the prospects, because – For him to say he's not worried about Bobby Brink, like, again, if we go back, and I'm sorry, but we have to do it at least one more time, and it's probably going to come up again. But if we have to go back to the draft with Cole Caulfield, he's 53 goals ahead of Bobby Brink, right? That's 53 goals, and that's because Caulfield got hurt last year. Otherwise, he'd have scored more. And and York is kind of there, but he's not a top-pairing defenseman. So, like, there's if I'm 
the team. I have to be worried about that. I'm not worried about York per se because he's going to help me, but I'm worried about the fact that we're now this far into it. We made sure we got Brink to kind of make that deal solid, and that didn't make the deal solid yet. Yeah, I think this is a time will tell situation. It's what we've been yeah. saying, um, but I think this year is critical for both of those guys to see what the value ultimately will be for them, for the Flyers. Yeah. Um, getting into our training camp discussion, just want to introduce y'all to our categories of players that we're going to talk about over the next segment. So we have our returning vets, our mainstays, the pressure cooker, the new guys, and the goalies. So lots of guys to get through. We're going to get through it as quickly as possible and talk about expectations for all of them coming up next. Snap into action this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 on bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. We will have more training camp coverage as the week continues, getting uh, closer to our first preseason game next week. Uh, in the meantime, talking about our returning vets, we've pretty much covered that so far uh, in Sean Couture and Cam Atkinson. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know what we expect from them is really just we need to see what they can handle uh, as far as their durability um, to really assess whether they are in fact healthy. Right. That is the whole thing this year. I'm not even worried about how many points they might put up. Uh, I am worried about uh, John putting these guys in too many situations, though. I know he's desperate to get a better penalty kill here, but you kind of have to ease these guys into it because that is hard work. If you're going to, again, is Couture going to start to play the power play, the penalty kill, take all these faceoffs? Is he ready to do all of that? I mean, doesn't that seem like a, a, a little bit much to, you know, to start the season? I think you have to consider some of that. Yep. And I, I think those are going to be the big questions and, and the expectations for us, for those guys, just to keep, you know, paying attention to all those things and see where they really are. Um, as far as the mainstays go, I, I think, these are kind of like your middle vets, right? That are slightly younger, but still, you know, are, are pretty solidly in, in this lineup. That's your Scott Lawton, Joel Farabee, Travis Konechny, Rasmus Ristolainen, and Noah Cates. Yeah, so, you know, like Ristolainen as an example, like we know what he is. They're trying to get a little more offense out of him. I don't blame him because he used to have more, but... You know, the defense is there. There's going to be some mistakes and the physicality is there. Noah Cates, yes, you're going to try and get more offense out of him. There's not a ton more to get out of him, though. And I just, that's just my belief. I've watched him enough to know that he's really good all around, really good defensively, but he's not going to be this 65 point guy. He's not. So there's a little bit more to get out of him. And Morgan Frost, we're starting to see, like, there's, there's been nothing that has happened in the last year that has worried me about Morgan Frost. To me, it's all been positive. You go look at his face-offs. You go look at the way he's handling the puck, uh, the, the, the weight that he's put on, the strength, all of that. It's all been positive for me. I think people nitpick too much about him. Yeah, well, that's why I wouldn't necessarily put him in this category. But um, as far as like Lawton, Farabee, and Konechny, I think it's really just to you know maybe pick up where they left off at the end of last season, I think, you know, Farabee again was recovering from that surgery over the course of last season. So he really just needs to kind of continue to grow from where he left off at the end of, of last season. And I think Lawton and Konechny, they just got to like, you know, at least maintain where they were last season, if not Im improve. Um, right. But I think it's very clear what those expectations are going into this season. No, I, I, I Agree a hundred percent on those guys. So the pressure cooker guys, I yeah. think there's, you know, out of the frying pan into the fire, so to speak. Uh, there's two different blocks of, of these guys. There's the, you know, middle vets 
like you're talking about that are under a little more pressure. Travis Sandheim is one of them because the bigger contract is kicking in and we and don't, we don't know what he is. We, we still don't yeah. really know what he is. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was up and down last season and there's a lot more pressure on him because of Ivan Provorov being gone and where right. is he going to fit into the lineup? And he, he's really has to prove his worth this season, I think, and, and take up some of that slack. Yeah. I mean, the team can't pre- pretend that losing Provorov is, is going to be a good thing. It's not going to be a good thing. I don't think people realized how much John Tortorella relied on Ivan Provorov to go out there a million shifts on very short shifts and to play in all situations and to play the way he did. I know Torts would occasionally praise Provorov, but you know that he was indispensable for him. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, other guys in this block, I would say Morgan Frost a little bit because he's always under pressure. He's never. Yeah. I know, but I just talked easy. about it. I, I don't yeah. agree on it, but yeah. Yeah. Um, Wade Allison, I think, is okay, under so, a lot of so, pressure. So here's the thing. So he had 15 points in 60 games. 60 is the most he's really ever played. And so I look at that and I say, okay, if I get you to 75 games, you kind of have to get me like 25, 30 points or otherwise in the future, I got players that could take that job. I mean, I get it. He plays physical too. We all like him, but at some point you're going to look at Wade Allison and say the production is not enough. So he has to have more production and play more if that's possible. If it's not possible, I I think he's going to end up getting moved at some point because when the flyers get better, they're just not going to have a roster spot for him. Yeah. I just want him to stay healthy through camp. That is like (laughs) the bar is low right now. That's a low bar, man. Into uh, you know the production, all all the things you're saying are true, but just for now, I want him to stay healthy through camp. Um, I think Cam York is in a similar boat to Travis Sanheim in terms of picking up the slack defensively. Um, Obviously, different in terms of veteran status and the contract, but still, you know, we talked about it a little bit already. Yeah, get the shot on net. That's the biggest thing for Cam York. Get your shot on net. And then uh, we have some, you know, older prospects that are under pressure to really take that next step forward in order to be considered part of this rebuild and part of the future. And I would say Zamula, Owen Tippett, Tanner Lazinski, um, mystery child, um, Ali Lixel, and Ronnie Adder all fit into that boat. I hope the best for Tanner Lazinski. I They haven't been giving him much of a chance. So matter of fact, if they'd have given him a chance, they wouldn't have gotten paling, right? So I think... Yeah. Uh, Lisinski not going to get much of a shot here. And that's just the way it is. Zamula will get some shot, but let's be realistic here. I'm going to put my cards on the table here. I mean, if I were coaching this team, if I were the GM of this team, Zamula would get a huge shot to start the season. And Nick Sealer would be a role player for me. He would play occasionally because again, Nick Sealer is not going to help my team when they're good, but I've got something here in Zamula, but he needs to play a certain amount of games with a decent defenseman and really to turn into something, just putting him in occasionally or putting him in when you're playing seven, because it's one of those games where they're playing seven, Rachel. I mean, it's not going to be enough. Yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And Nick Sealer made my category, the other guys. So if if that's any indication, I will say with Tanner Luzinski, um, he is my Roman empire. um, If you get that reference. I do. And um, I I think about him and his success and where he fits probably more often than I should, but I care. And I, I I think that to have like just ships passing in the night with him and his skill set and where he could fit would be so disappointing for me personally. And for him, I think he has a lot of potential. He does. I, you know, I watched him since college. Uh, I think injuries yeah. had gotten the best of him early on. And I think there were moments where we saw some good things out of him. Yeah. Uh, the goalies we have also already talked about uh, when we talked about Danny Breer's uh, Yeah comments and i think yeah that's kind of where we're at where we think carter hart's the number one we don't know it 100 percent, but we think and then samerson is the de facto backup until we see otherwise yeah the goalie situation is not as settled as danny briere would like to like you to believe yeah uh, i mean he didn't new- want to well we'll rephrase it he wanted you to believe that you know hart was settled that's the one but we, you know there's this little bit of a cloud that makes us not believe that but then the rest yeah he says it's wide open and i don't think it's wide open so it's like however you want to interpret 
Um, what he said, I just think the opposite right now for the goaltending. Uh, the new guys, Garnet Hathaway, Ryan Paling, Sean Walker, and Mark Stahl. Um, I think it's just getting to know them and figuring out where they fit and what they can contribute is kind of the remit here to start the season. I wish them all good seasons, right? But I have to be yeah. honest, and I'm honest on this show, and the more guys you have like that, the less playing time there is for younger players and opportunity. That's just a fact. That yeah, is an absolute Bre fact. Breer mentioned Mark Stahl specifically and didn't mention Sean Walker when he was talking about defensive support, which I thought was interesting as part of that. Yeah, so they like Stahl because Tortorella likes Stahl. Like, we have to remember, there's a history there. And Mark Stahl was an unbelievable defenseman for John Tortorella, and he remembers that. So if you think you're getting Mark Stahl out of this lineup, unless there's an injury, you're not. So Walker, yeah, maybe he could be overtaken by somebody. But again, you start thinking about it, Hathaway. Like, it's fine to bring these guys in, but the more of these guys you have, the fewer young players that are going to play. And Nick Delorier too. You know, there's going to be a point in time where you're going to say, why do we have Nick Delorier and Hathaway in the same lineup? Mark yeah. my words. Yeah, well, Nick Delorier and Nick Sealer were my two, the other guys, right. category, uh, because they just should be who they are and don't change. Right. Uh, just stay I agree who with you that. are and don't change. But do you agree with that other point? That <laughs> oh, you, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, I think at some point it, you're going to want more offensive production, but – if you're going to tell they me you're not have to, they just have to not be afraid to sit those kind of guys right, right. In, in favor of the kids. Yeah. If you're going to tell me you're not tanking, I'll say, okay, you're not tanking, but are you playing your best offensive lineup? No, they're not going to be playing their best uh, potential offensive lineup. All right. Well, we're going to wrap up with some of your mailbag questions coming up next. All right. We've got a few mailbag questions to wrap up today's show, uh, Evan emailed us and asked, will they trade Lawton or Atkinson? Why is Coots not named captain yet? He signed long-term. If he had a comeback year, he's the perfect leader for the rebuild. Two good questions here. Yeah, for, for the Couturier question, I think he should be captain. But again, if the team believes he could play the rest of his contract out and be the guy he is, he should be named captain already. But I don't know if the team believes that. Um, the other part, um, I don't think Lawton will get traded. I don't, I don't think there's a need to trade him. And who was the other player? Atkinson. Atkinson will get traded at the deadline if healthy. So somehow he's got to get healthy, stay healthy by the deadline and he'll get, he'll, he will get dealt. Yeah. I think uh, trading Lawton will only happen if it's like a sweetheart deal that the Flyers can't refuse you Correct. Know, where they get a ton of return that's overvalued for right. Him. Um, uh, Atkinson, I can see getting traded at the deadline, uh, if he's healthy and, and producing, I think he would be a good candidate for that, for the flyers for sure. And but I agree with to... you... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I agree with you about Sean Couturier and a captaincy. They just don't know his health and it's not a, a good thing to name him as captain and then have him to be unhealthy. Yeah. And there's a danger in trading a lot and right. He doesn't make too much money mm -hmm. and he is a flyer through and through. You can't yep. trade all of those kinds of guys. You have to keep some of them. Yep. And I think Lawton is the perfect one to keep, to be honest. Uh, Andrew wants to know, can you explain how the Flyers were able to sign players like Zamula and Avon as free agents? Is it because they went unselected and were in invited to development camp? Would they have re-entered the draft if they weren't signed? Um, yeah, I think they both would have re-entered the draft. Yeah. I think... Avon had an injury or didn't mm -hmm. have a big year his, his last year. I can't remember the exact circumstances. So that put him out there. I remember we watched him in camp and then said, man, they probably should sign this guy. Cause otherwise, yes, somebody definitely would, um, would draft him. And Zamula was an interesting one because I think he really was a diamond in the rough. And, and I yep. think uh, it's just one of those things where, you know, you go undrafted and, you know, a team looks at you and all of a sudden, you know, they like you and he shows something. And I, so I think that still happens. It doesn't happen as much in the NHL now, but it does still happen. Like Phil Myers, you know, Philippe yeah. Myers was and, the same way. And the Calgary Hitmen are a great team for that. They develop guys that kind of come out of nowhere yes. 
somewhat frequently. So it it was not a shock to me that a guy came out of the hitmen like oh. like that. And the Flyers, I think, just pounced on that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Tom Servo asks, uh, the biggest weakness is European scouting for the Flyers. They can't seem to draft any high caliber European players like the rest of, of the NHL. Is that true? That's true. I mean, they, they at least took a step with Michkov. Um, Tuamala is really up in the air as far as how good he is. Uh, the, you know, the management of Tuamala up to right now has not been great, even though like they tasked Sammy Kapanen with it last year, but Sammy Kapanen's new in the job. How much could he really do? Like, I just think a lot has, has slid through the cracks. And I think the other part is where a lot of teams in the last couple of years have been going heavy Euro for like the last three rounds. The Flyers have not. And, and I think that is something that will hurt them down the road because there have been a lot of decent players that really need more development, but they're going to develop over there. That is good for a team to get. It's good to get them because you don't have to sign them to a quick ELC like you do in the Canadian Hockey League, and you don't have to put them on the payroll until they actually want to come over. Yeah. It seems like their scouting is decent on the goaltending front. In yes. Europe, but like yes. for skaters is where the weakness is. That's a weakness, yes. And and so I think that that is definitely something they need to improve in the future and just have have more tendrils out there and more sources. I think just um, expanding that staff, especially. And I think that there's some real good opportunities in Europe that aren't necessarily Sweden or Finland. I think the hockey programs in Czechia, in Germany, um, in Austria, like there, there are other hockey markets developing. Oh, they're all improving. There's no doubt. And the Swiss. I mean, we've seen the success of the Swiss yeah. programs, and we haven't like even touched that very much no. on the flyer side of things. Um, no. We have Brian Zanetti, and that's it. So I think that there's more opportunities there, and we need tendrils in more places in Europe. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Bruce uh, suggests that the team needs to pick top five for the next three drafts. Do we think it's that dire or we really just need one, one and a half more good top draft picks here? No, I think, look, I, th- I think if you go back um, and Nolan Patrick doesn't have the migraines or get hurt, uh, this wouldn't hurt us all as much right now, but it happens. It happens to everybody. You know, you could look at what happens to, to a lot of picks that don't make it all kinds of circumstances. So next three is a little bit much. If they were, you know, I think they nailed Mitchkoff at least to the point where he will be a, a really, really good player in the league. Superstar. I don't know. It takes a while for me to call anybody a superstar, but he'll be a really, really good player. If they get another really, really good player in this draft, that would go a long way. And then you always figure there's going to be somebody that steps up in the one of these last couple of drafts that, you know, overplays what you expected. And if you start getting that, that would impact the team greatly. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, I don't think we need to, you know, tank for the next three years to get top five picks. I think that we really do have to do whatever is necessary, especially at this upcoming trade deadline to get the a bunch of assets so that not only can we have a lot of solid picks, in this next draft, but have those assets to make trade, to start making trades to improve the team. Otherwise, right. We can sell those assets, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cause you look, I I mean, this this year should be a combination of those things. At the end of the day, you could have all the prospects like Ottawa, but they have a hard time signing all of those prospects. Now, if the cap were up another 9 million, like it's rumored next year, maybe it'd be easier, but right now they got Shane Pinto and all this stuff going on. um, And they think they're going to sign them. But again, they haven't signed him yet. That becomes a worry too. There is a thing having too many prospects because again, if you have too many good prospects, let's say you have six or seven of these guys, they all want big contracts. At some point, you do have to make a trade or two. Yep, absolutely. 
All right, that will do it for today's show. It was a whirlwind getting through all of our guys heading in to training camp. We'll have more on that later this week. On tomorrow's show, we are going to continue our Metro Division season preview crossovers with the guys from Locked On Penguins. Really excited for that one. As a reminder, we always want to hear from you. So if you've got a mailbag question, you can send it to us via Twitter at Locked On Flyers. You can email us at Locked On Flyers at Gmail or comment over on YouTube. I'm Rachel. I'm on Twitter at our Miriam. That's R M I R I A M. I'm Russ. I'm at Sportsology, S P O R T S O L O G Y. Have a fantastic day, everybody.